geez, who are all these guys with these helmets on? Not all of them had it, but I sort of kind of almost looked like, I thought it was like a platoon of military coming in. <laughs> but it's not. It looks like motorcycles, maybe. Maybe ATVers or something. Very interesting. So, howdy there once again, YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo. First off, if this video is, uh, or the intro, is too long for you, then please skip to a part that interests you by utilizing the parts section in the description box below. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like my work. Also, please visit my website. It contains an amazing amount of information. It can show you how to find seismic data, how to analyze it, with what programs to analyze it with, and much more. It even shows you earthquake examples and hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots pertaining to many different earthquake swarms and events. There is also a link in the description box below, right under my email address. I keep adding new content, so check back every once in a while. This is the monthly volcano report for February 2019. I know this is kind of late, just like my previous update, but I have finally gotten it out. The reported earthquake counts I state are taken directly from the United States Geological Survey and their partners, and are only earthquakes reported, not earthquakes recorded. In regards to earthquake counts, it is likely the majority of the time that the reported earthquake total for a given location and time period, mostly during earthquake swarms, is lower than the actual count of earthquakes, in certain cases sometimes drastically lower. This has to do with a multitude of factors, including inability to locate, you know, lack of instruments, and actually other reasons that, to be honest, make no sense to me right now. You can especially see this on my new Yellowstone Rapid Fire Earthquake Swarm page, link below as well. It is my goal to eventually major in seismology and also study volcanology, but I do believe I am properly equipped to give you guys a major heads up if anything concerning may occur at volcanoes throughout the United States, and maybe even the world, too. Remember, most earthquake swarms and volcanoes do not lead to eruptions, but almost every eruption is preceded by an earthquake swarm. This is why earthquake swarms should always be monitored closely, especially ones that are underreported but clearly show hundreds of events. The volcanoes I will be doing monthly and yearly updates on will be Yellowstone Supervolcano in Wyoming, Long Valley Supervolcano in California, Newberry Caldera and Mount Hood in Oregon, Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and Mount Shasta and Lassen Peak in California. Glacier Peak, a volcano that is about 50 miles or so east of me, has no monitoring instruments except one sometimes faulty seismograph. It works all right, but sometimes it goes in and out here and there. They really need some new ones. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is supposedly putting new instruments there soon, by the end of this year, hopefully, and Glacier Peak will be added to the updates once monitor installation has been completed. In this video and other updates, we will look at earthquake and deformation counts. The time period of the reported earthquake counts for this video, derived from the USGS Earthquake Catalog, is from 0 UTC, February 1st, 2019, to 2359 UTC, February 28th, 2019, which is actually two days shorter than other months, and magnitudes are going to be negative 0.5 and above, so you will see every single earthquake that was reported for this time period. Yes, earthquakes can occur at negative magnitudes, but require sensitive seismographs to locate. Thank God a lot of the seismic instruments being activated these days are sensitive, excuse me, sensitive enough for such recordings. I like to call these negative earthquakes micro minis. Every month's update will be uploaded about five days or so after the month in question has ended. Sorry for, again, taking really long to finish this. Also, in regards to the three plot images that I generate for the largest events, I will always try my best to use the closest seismic station to any given event. As always, let's start with Yellowstone. So here we are at Yellowstone. There were 89 reported earthquake events for Yellowstone area for the month of February 2019. Although February is two days shorter than a normal month, the count for this month is close to the same as last month's. There were a few minor swarms this month, but nothing major. There was also a swarm on February 20th, 2019, just to the north of West Yellowstone, Montana. You can see a few bursts of seismicity, northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, just north of West Thumb Lake. Right here, which is south of Purple Mountain, up here near Hebgen Lake and Maple Creek. And then we have the largest event, which occurred right down here. And then a lonely, lonely earthquake down here in the Tetons. If you wish, please come to my website, go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, and go to Yellowstone Supervolcano. And I do have two pages on here for the February 19th through 20th minor, minor rapid-fire swarm at the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. And then down here, we have a February 16, 2019 Mary Lake swarm. In this post, I did say that they did not report the events, I believe. 
but I believe they have reported them already. The Swarm Epicenter was right next to YML. I thought it was more towards the east, but it was just slightly to the west, but I was close. So the swarm that occurred at West Yellowstone happened basically on the same day as the minor rapid fire swarm at Yellowstone Lake, which are usually of much more interest to me. Also, Steamboat Geyser in the Norse Geyser Basin erupted four times in the month of February. So let's go to the Seismic Events drop down menu and click Steamboat Geyser 2019. Go there. This will show you all of the steamboat eruptions for 2019 that have already occurred. The seismic plots to them. By the way, do not forget Steamboat Geyser 2018, which shows every single steamboat eruption that ever occurred in 2018. So again, steamboat erupted four times in February. The last one in February was on February 25th, going up to about 5,000, 6,000 amplitude count. Then the last one going up to about 6,000 to 6,200 amplitude count. And then the first one, uh, no, wait a second, the second one of February went up to about maybe 8,000 amplitude count. No, I'm going to say 6,000, never mind. And then the first one of February went up to about maybe 8,000, 10,000 amplitude count. So you can see they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And actually, I know this didn't happen in February, but the most recent eruption, which occurred on March 5th, was the smallest eruption ever recorded by Seismic Station YNM, to the best of my knowledge. They are getting smaller, but again, it looks like the eruptions will continue into the foreseeable future until they just stop. Now, the Yellowstone Volcano Monthly Report, which, which was put out on March 1st, but deals with the entire month of February, I believe is put out by USGS and uh, I believe Michael Poland, I believe is the one that puts it out. Yellowstone National Park turns 147 today. Woo! The park was founded when President Ulysses S. Grant signed the bill that created the nation's first national park on March 1st, 1872. Apparently, Yellowstone is the nation's first national park. Very interesting. There were four water eruptions of Steamboat Geyser in February, February 1st, 8th, 16th, and 26th. Discharge measured at this tantalus steam gauge suggests that these eruptions may have been smaller than past events of the current sequence, which started in March 2018. Although it is difficult to confirm this without direct observations. Well, actually, guys, it's actually not that difficult if you look at the amplitude count. Now, if you're listening to this or if anybody from USG is listening to this, the amplitude counts on the seismogram plots can be used to judge the size of the eruptions. Basically because I discovered that the steamboat eruptions, the vibrations shown up on YNM, which used to actually show up on YNR as well, those are the surface vibrations. Those are traveling on the surface, which means that a, a, an eruption 10 times the strength of the er most recent eruption would travel much farther. And so it's definitely because the eruption starts right when the trace starts. So we know that these are the surface vibrations. For some reason, I'm still having a hard time finding any hydrothermal tremor leading up to the eruptions. I'm still looking into that, still trying to find that out. But you can use the amplitude count on the left of any seismogram plot to judge the size of these steamboat eruptions. They are definitely much, much smaller. But it does not mean it's dying. It does not mean it's dying. So who knows? Seismicity... February 2019, the University of Utah Seismograph Station is responsible for the operation and analysis of Yellowstone Seismic Network, located 81 earthquakes in the Yellowstone National Park region. The largest event was a 3.1 on February 16th. February seismicity in Yellowstone included a swarm of 17 located earthquakes on February 20th. Notice how they're starting to use the term located earthquakes because a lot of the earthquakes within a lot of the rapid fire swarms are not located and reported. The swarm events ranged in magnitude from 0.1 to 1.7 and were located 5 miles north of West Yellowstone. Earthquake swarms like this are common. Yes, they are. Ground deformation as recorded by GPS stations, which actually I will show you how to do that in my next video, how to make your own GPS charts. Ground subsidence of Yellowstone caldera continues as it has since 2015 at a rate of a few millimeters per month. Actually, ground subsidence is not continuing. Uh, from January 1st to pretty much right now, March 8th, it has basically been a battle. There's been no upwards trend or downwards trend. There is neither subsidence, there, there's neither continued subsidence or continued uplift going on. It seems like an actual battle is taking place between the two because from January 1st to March 8th, there is very little net change at all. Kind of like they say for Norris Geyser Basin, which has stalled out as well. 
For the Yellowstone Super Volcanic Complex, the largest earthquake to occur within the month of January 2019 was a magnitude 3.1 at 8.2 kilometers in depth in a strange location which struck far south of the Maple Creek area in a location that does not see as much seismicity as the rest of the caldera. It struck on February 16, 2019 at 2122 UTC. It was actually reportedly felt by six people. A few people at the caldera felt it, and a few people up in Montana reportedly felt it as well. Very, very interesting. Now, we can see the plots of the largest event for the month of February for Yellowstone Caldera on my blog post here on my Seismo blog on my website. Three earthquakes, magnitude 3.0, strike the USA within about three hours. And very interesting that this magnitude 3.1 in Yellowstone was part of a series of magnitude 3.0s that struck around the USA within a space of about three hours. Very interesting. Now let's scroll down. Here is the three plot image to the largest earthquake to occur at Yellowstone within the month of February. Again, magnitude 3.1 at 8.2 kilometers in depth. Dominant lower frequencies below 10 hertz, but there are of course stronger frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. Looks like a normal uh, VT, volcano tectonic earthquake. And there were a few teeny tiny aftershocks afterwards, but it was not part of an actual swarm. So... Now here are the GPS deformation charts for Yellowstone Caldera. Let's go to the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake to LKWY. Now please keep this in mind when seeing the following blue charts. Please keep in mind the top chart which says east shows east-west horizontal deformation. The middle chart which says north shows north-south horizontal deformation, and the final chart at the bottom shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Again, the top two are horizontal, and the last one at the bottom says up, which is vertical, uplift or subsidence. Although all three directions are important, the one to watch mainly is the vertical chart here at the bottom. Sadly, we can see the data stream has ended recently, but good thing it was just reactivated about a week ago or so. There seems to be neither uplift or subsidence occurring, so let's take a look at another station. The vertical chart here shows a range of 0 0.3 meters from bottom to top since about 2004. Now let's go back and go to OFW2. Now here's the GPS deformation chart near the Upper Geyser Basin near where Old Faithful resides. Here it seems the data stream is uninterrupted. We see it is likely subsidence is continuing to be recorded on this station. However, it is very quite hard to tell. The north-south chart doesn't seem to be changing too much. And same goes for the east-west chart here at the top. Now, if uplift starts again, which I truly believe will happen in the next two years at the max, then it will show greatly on these stations just like the last two periods of uplift did. Notice we had a period of uplift right here, slightly calmed, and then we had a slightly larger period of uplift 2014-2015, and then around 2016 or so it started to die down, and we have not been at these levels since late 2006. Yes, guys, we are at the lowest level of subsidence since late 2006. That's a long time. If this pattern of breathing will continue, we should see another round of uplift soon. However, that remains to be seen. The vertical chart at the bottom shows a total range of 0 0.25 meters from bottom to top. Now, here is my first custom-generated GPS chart. I am almost done with the video and the how-to video on how to make these yourself. And it'll most likely be out in the next two days. Well, unless something else crazy happens. Here we see data from OFW2, Analysis Center CWU, NAM08 reference frame. STDW is the section I use for this data, which is up, vertical, uplift or subsidence, and measurements on the left are in meters. So notice from 0 0.01 to 0 0.012, that is 0 0.002 meters. Very small. I believe that's only two millimeters. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that is only two millimeters. Very, very tiny change. Very tiny. Remember, these GPS instruments are accurate down to the millimeter. So any change you see that is occurring less than a millimeter, then it could be wrong or it could be true as well. Again, this chart here shows up down ground deformation. In other words, uplift or subsidence. Again, the label on the left is in meters. So from here, 
sorry, my bad. Let me go back. Let me see if I have this correct. Let's see, 12 millimeters is 0.012 meters. So from zero all the way at the bottom to 0.012, that's 12 millimeters. But we notice there's been virtually no continued uplift or continued subsidence. If you take Microsoft Excel and add a trend line to this, there is a slight, slight upwards growing trend of all this data. But again, that change is so minimal, it could just be an error. But then again, you don't know. We don't know. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on, but the rest of the caldera is seeming like it's neither uplift or subsidence has been occurring. Again, it's from January 1st, 2019 to March 6th, 2019. And here are the deformation charts for WLWY, which resides just a few miles northeast of LKWY Yellowstone Lake. The top two horizontal deformation charts are not showing much of a change. You can see a battle looks like it is taking place here as well with uplift subsidence, but why don't we take a closer look? The total range of the vertical deformation chart is 0.45 meters from bottom to top. Now here's my custom chart for WLWY from January 1st, 2019 to March 6th, 2019, showing vertical uplift or subsidence. Again, this is in meters. So a lot of this change is down at the one millimeter level. Very insignificant change. Very, very, very small. I believe it's from this line right here to this line right here is only what, like zero. 0.1 millimeters i believe so a very small change nothing too crazy is happening except there was a tiny hump right here that was very i mean it was tiny but it did coincide with a lot of the other data in the area but it might i mean it might not be anything but still we should keep an eye on it these spikes are very interesting it's not showing on the other reference frame but we'll just have to continue and wait and see where this is headed and again, the changes are so small, it is barely worth mentioning, but if I didn't mention it while showing it, I wouldn't be much of a volcano monitor, huh? <laughs> Regardless, it is best to use every tool possible to monitor these growing beasts. Here we are back at the GPS deformation charts. Let's go to NRWY in the Norris Geyser Basin. So here's NRWY. As before, it does seem the uplift here has ceased. Could the increased uplift have been caused by a large influx in hydrothermal fluids preparing for the many steamboat eruptions? I am theorizing steamboat geyser, due to the large quantity and size of the eruptions, has its own type of hydrothermal chamber. I mean, it's not just a circle and like an oval chamber down there with a tube leading up to the surface. I mean, it's probably more intricate than that, but I do believe it does have its own hydrothermal, cha uh, excuse me, hydrothermal chamber, kind of like any volcano with its own magma chamber. It will be interesting to see where this leads, and Michael Pollan no notified me that there is some research going on into that exact topic as I speak, so it will be exciting to see where this research is headed. It is possible the uplift is not being caused by an influx of hydrothermal fluids, but rather in the early 2000s a magma intrusion event occurred and started sending up brine and other hot material that could have led to the 2018-2019 steamboat eruption period. That info was also provided as a possibility by Michael Poland, the director of the volcano Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. Excuse me. Again, the uplift has paused, but I am expecting caldera-wide uplift to start again in the next two years at the max. And that is just a projection. Please know that could be very wrong. I base it off of the past few years of seismicity, the seismicity during increased uplift at the caldera, and the past few decades of uplift subsidence patterns, especially the knowledge of deformation in previous decades. In total, the vertical chart here shows a total of 0.25 meters from bottom to top. Now you can see here current deformation from January 1st, 2019 to March 6, 2019 for Norris NRWY GPS instrument. And it looks minimal for the vertical component. Again, this is vertical uplift or subsidence from right here to right here is 0 0.0005 meters. So that's a very, very, very small increment. I believe that's what, 0 0.5 millimeters? So that's not even a millimeter. Remember, these instruments are accurate down to the millimeter. Any changes you see that occur smaller than a millimeter could be an error. But don't take me wrong, it could be real. But then again, it could be an error. There are millimeter level accuracy, which is what the UNAVCO states. Again, it appears a battle is taking place here as well, and there are no sustained uplift or subsidence patterns, and there is no growing or shrinking trend at all. It's just straight. And this is for, what, the past three months or so? Completely straight. Now let's move on to another potentially dangerous supervolcano which resides in eastern California near Yosemite National Park. So here we are at the Long Valley Supervolcanic Complex. There were 184 reported earthquake events during the month of February 2019. 
Although the month of February is two days shorter than a normal month, this is still far less seismicity than spotted in January. Excuse me. It seems Long Valley is starting to somewhat quiet down. Could the decrease in major seismicity and the decrease in uplift be connected? I believe so since both seem to have started around the same time, but there is just so much dang magma down there that I highly doubt this will last forever. In my opinion, Long Valley Supervolcano is much closer to an eruption than Yellowstone is, and already likely contains enough magma to produce a voluminous super eruption if it erupted at full potential today. The Mount St. Helens eruption was so large, but only ejected 0.29 cubic miles of ash during its eruption. During the next Long Valley eruption, it is rumored it could produce 140 cubic miles of ash in Tephra. Can you imagine? There is, of course, no sign of that at all right now, but Long Valley and the Mammoth Mountain area already saw a major magma intrusion event in the late 90s. They even saw an increase in degassing, which killed animals and vegetation. It was pretty serious, and I'm very surprised it led to nothing. I bet you anything there were a bunch of low-frequency events during that time. Now, as we can see here, after we turn the satellite on, the caldera rim is right here. Grayscale kind of makes it look like the caldera rim is down here, but it's not. It's right in this area right there. Again, as usual, they are occurring on the southwestern and southern rim of the caldera. It is also interesting to note that the ground was usually rising, seeing uplift, while heading to the southwest, as proven with the following GPS charts in just a bit. So there must be a connection if we were seeing large swarms on the deformation front, which is what we did. Of course, more quakes spread out to the south, but that is pretty much it. The largest reported earthquake for February 2019 was a magnitude 3.0 at 3.1 kilometers in depth on February 4th, 2019 at 201 UTC. It struck in the southern portion of the caldera and two people reported feeling it. Most of the time, the northern half of Long Valley Caldera is eerily silent because I believe since the ground is shifting towards the southwest and uplift, usually was occurring. I believe that is why we see a lot of the seismicity in the southwestern to southern portion of Long Valley Caldera. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the most recent largest earthquake to occur at Long Valley Supervolcano within the month of February from the closest seismic station. Looks like a normal VT, volcano tectonic earthquake, and dominant frequencies remain below 15 hertz. Strongest frequencies, of course, below 5 hertz, but strong frequencies still went well beyond 25 hertz, so it was a normal high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Lasted a good amount of time, but looks normal to me. And here we have the GPS deformation instruments for Long Valley Caldera. Let's click P639, which is south of the center of the caldera. Now again, when view viewing excuse me, these blue three chart images, the top chart shows east-west horizontal deformation, the middle chart shows north-south horizontal deformation, and the bottom chart here shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Remember last update how I said uplift has stalled and there seems to be a battle taking place? Well, I lost my bet, guys! Time to pay up! It seems subsidence has won the battle by a large margin. However, I doubt this subsidence will last long, based on the past months and years of uplift subsidence patterns. The north-south chart is not showing too much of a change, and neither is the east-west chart. Notice how both horizontal charts have been angling downwards, at almost a perfect angle somewhat, for a very long time. That means the ground is slowly but steadily moving towards the southwest, coincidentally the same direction the majority of the earthquakes occur at Long Valley. The vertical chart from bottom to top, bottom to top, is 0 0.08 meters. So Yellowstone is still seeing much higher deformation counts than Long Valley is in the long run. For your convenience, here is my custom GPS chart I created for P639, the station we just looked at for Long Valley Caldera, from January 1st, 2019 to March 6th, 2019. Again, uplift subsidence, this is a vertical component, and meters are labeled on the left. Note from this line here to this line here is only 0 0.0002 meters, which I believe is 0.2 millimeters. Well, with, uh, that's, yeah, it's still a very, very small change. Remember, these are millimeter level accuracy uh, GPS instruments, so pretty much any change below a millimeter is not too major. I mean, obviously it's not major at all, but it could be an error or it could be real.
So anything occurring above a millimeter is usually occurring for real, but there can be many errors when dealing with anything less than a millimeter. Note again that there is such a tiny change it is barely worth mentioning from January to March. Wait a second, so uplift is somewhat stalled at Yellowstone and Long Valley as well? Kind of around the same time, maybe? I don't, I don't know if it's around the same time, but they're both stalling out. It's very strange, very strange. And seismicity at Long Valley and Yellowstone is lower than is what expected? Wait, and the Cascade Volcanoes are still extremely quiet below background levels? What the heck is going on? We should see a lot more activity. We shouldn't see this much silence, at least in my opinion. I don't know what is going on, guys. Personally, I believe a lot of the silence could be a precursor to something, but please don't laugh at me. I don't know what that could be. <laughs> you know, that is what I truly believe because all of these locations in this video should not be as quiet as they are right now. But here's the same chart that I just showed, but freshly generated from Microsoft Excel. Now go up again. This is station P639 at Long Valley Caldera. Let's scroll back down. Now, when I press the trend line, let's go here. Okay, so let's press trend line. Notice there is a slight growing trend. Do you notice that? There's this uh, trend line, which Microsoft Excel, I love how they put the trend line on there. It shows if there's a growing or shrinking trend at all. There is a slight, very minimal growing trend. So although subsidence was victorious in the battle, it does look like the ground could be starting to rise again. Now this has yet to be confirmed and definitely could change, but there is a very small trend heading upwards for the data from January 1st, 2019 to March 6th, 2019. Remember though, the measurements and the change is extremely tiny, but we will have to keep an eye on this and we'll see where it's headed in the next update, or you can wait for my uh, GPS deformation video that I'm putting out very, very soon, and you can learn how to do this yourself and monitor it whenever you want from the comfort of your own home. We're back at Long Valley Volcanic Center at volcanos.usgs.gov. We just looked at P639. Let's go over here to CA99. Now, here we are at the GPS deformation station, CA99. Now, contrary to the previous station I just showed, this station shows a much longer data stream going back to a little bit before 2001 instead of April 2014 like we saw on the previous station. It seems right around 2011 is when Long Valley started to see increased, almost constant uplift patterns. The top two horizontal charts are also showing the ground again is steadily moving towards the southwest, just like the other GPS stations in the area. For the vertical chart at the bottom, we see a total of 0 0.16 meters from the top of the chart to the bottom. Let's go back and go to the center of the caldera, RDOM, which is a little bit less active, but still sees some uplift patterns. So we have RDOM, which resides again right in the center of the caldera. We see this chart started in April 2014 and shows basically the same horizontal pattern here as well. Just like the other GPS stations, proving Long Valley caldera is slowly shifting towards the southwest, albeit very slowly. Also, we see the same recent battle in uplift and subsidence here as well. However, it seems subsidence has won the battle, just like we saw on the other stations, which actually last occurred in this fashion right around the start of 2017. Notice that? Seems like there was the same dip right here, lasted maybe a couple months or so, and then shot right back up. Seems like it's had the same pattern. Uplift, a little bit of subsidence, then some uplift, and a little bit of subsidence, a little bit of uplift. Now, I could say this is seasonal possibly i i do not no don't take me wrong i do not believe it's seasonal it could be seasonal since it's coinciding with with each season kind of but get this then how come there is an obvious growing trend notice if i added a trend line to this chart it would obviously be going up so why is it growing more and more and more and more and more I believe that's because of the influx of magma below. Now, there's already a lot of magma at Long Valley, guys. A lot of it. I'm not saying it's going to erupt, but it's definitely a super volcano we should definitely keep an eye on. So we will see where this is headed. Again, from bottom to top, we see a total of 0 0.09 meters. So the change is not too great, but that's because it's in the center of the caldera. More, I believe the next eruption of Long Valley super volcano will occur southwest. I believe it'll occur on the southwestern rim. That whole area could just go up. That's where I believe the new eruption will occur whenever it decides to erupt. 
Next, let's move on to Newberry Caldera Volcano in Central Oregon, just south of Bend. Here we have Newberry Caldera in Oregon. Notice, I believe this is called the Obsidian Flow. I believe that's what it's called. My uncle has hiked here multiple times. I'd love to go hiking with him at this volcano. Again, it's still potentially active. Could erupt sometime in the future. It's definitely not dead. Definitely has an active magma chamber. You can see multiple lava flows issuing away. Some cinder cones. Some even more. Look at all these lava flows in this area, guys. Yeah, this area in Central Oregon is very volcanic. Again, this is Newberry Caldera, which resides in Central Oregon, just south of Bend. Now, we see only one here. Let me turn on grayscale just so you can see it better. Now, we see one lonely reported earthquake for the month of February 2019. Now, of course, seismicity is extremely low for Newberry most of the time, but I try to monitor this place as much as possible. There could have been a few teeny tiny microquakes that were not reported, but this is definitely the largest, I believe. It was a magnitude 0.6 low frequency event which struck at 9.0 kilometers in depth on February 13, 2019 at 20.05 UTC. Wait a second. How do I know that this was a low frequency event? Not only did I analyze it and look at the spectral content, but it was already reported by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network to be a low frequency event. Here, check it out. Let's go to Earthquakes and go to Custom Search. Click that and let the page open. Now press all, 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 and go down. Let's see, we do not want local events. We do not want unknown. We do not want regional. We only want low frequency. Notice how the custom search allows you to search for low frequency events. Now press query, and you will notice, drum roll please, 0 0.6 and 9.0 kilometers in depth on, let's turn on UTC, on February 13th at 20.05 UTC. Huh, that's funny. That's the same exact date, same exact time, same exact magnitude, and same exact depth. And it's on their low frequency catalog. And here are the waveform sap samples, excuse me, put out by PNSN of this low frequency event. Looks like low frequency tremor. Possibly harmonic tremor. Definitely not harmonic tremor. It's a low frequency earthquake. So it does look like PNSN is listing this event, which was reportedly the largest and only event of, 2000, of February 2019 for Newberry Caldera, as a low-frequency event. But was it low-frequency tremor or low-frequency earthquake? Before we check that out, if you don't already know, let's go to the Seismic 2 drop-down menu on my website. Click Cascade Volcanoes Low-Frequency Events 2017-2018. I have a page already dedicated to all of the recent low-frequency earthquakes to occur at Newberry Caldera, not counting the most recent one. Of course, this page is for all Cascade volcanoes, but Newberry has been the only one in the Cascade range experiencing an obvious increase in low-frequency events. Some low-frequency events were reported, and some were removed by PNSN from their catalog, which I have proof of that on this page, even though they truly were low-frequency earthquakes. Oh, and tremor, too. All you got to do is come to my website, link below my email address in the description box, hover over Seismic Events 2, and click Cascade Volcanoes Low Frequency Events, and I have a lot of them listed, and I'll put on the most recent one in just a bit. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest reported earthquake for Newberry Caldera for February 2019, also the only reported earthquake. It appears this low-frequency earthquake was the only seismic event during this day. Check out the data from CPCO if you wish. This magnitude 0.6 low-frequency earthquake struck at about 9.0 kilometers in depth right under Newberry Caldera. So why has the majority of the recent seismicity at Newberry been strictly low-frequency events? Now, of course, they have had some slightly higher frequency events, but the vast majority have been low-frequency earthquakes or tremor, as proven by the page on my website I just showed. We will keep an eye on Newberry Caldera. Apparently, it was studied and tested by some type of injection, which I believe to be unsafe, to see if Newberry Caldera is able to produce geothermal energy, via geothermal pumping. Yeah. Apparently they stopped their research so far, at least that's what I heard, and no more research has been done on the topic. Gee, maybe they decided it was not a good idea for this volcano. I wonder if what they did started these low frequency events. I'm not saying that for sure. I'm just saying, there's a high pass 0.6 hertz filter, because this is a broadband station to filter out the background microseisms. Notice it is low frequency earthquake, 
dominant and low frequencies can blatantly see that on the spectrogram. But on the spectropod, it seems dominant frequencies start around 1 hertz and end about 4 hertz or so, making this, again, a low frequency earthquake. So here we are at Newberry Caldera for the GPS deformation instrument. So let's click CPCO, which is right in the center of the caldera. Now, here's a different type of GPS chart, one that I do not personally like at all. I like the blue charts better. The yellow line is vertical, in other words, uplift subsidence. Blue is east-west, and green is north-south. I have showed these in many of my recent updates, and there has been no major changes as of late. To save on time, I will not be showing any more GPS deformation charts in this video, except for last and peak at the end. However, I will if there is a big change. But if you don't believe, or you would like to see it for yourself, all you have to do is go to volcanoes.usgs.gov, select a volcano of your choice, click monitoring what's on the page, and use the settings on the right of the map to select GPS stations. GPS stations, at least so far, are always marked by a blue star. You can make your own GPS deformation charts. However, the GPS stations used by the Cascade Volcano Observatory still is not downloading correctly, and I do not believe I know where to download the GPS data for the Cascade Volcano Observatory. I can for Long Valley, other areas in the United States, but there are certain blank spots that have no GPS instruments for UNAVCO and those other types of analysis centers. Now here we are at one of the most infamous Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Mount Rainier, which adds a beautiful but potentially deadly back backdrop excuse me, to the Seattle skyline and is the tallest mountain, period, volcano or not, tallest mountain in the Cascade Range. There have only been five, yes, five earthquakes reported for the month of February 2019 for Mount Rainier, which can also sometimes be called Mount Tacoma. Five earthquakes in one month for Rainier is extremely low. That is down by half of last month's activity, and it seems Cascade Volcanoes are still getting quieter and quieter. So why the heck are the Cascade Volcanoes getting so freaking quiet lately, guys? I really don't like the eerie silence. The largest earthquake reported for February 2019 for Mount Rainier was a magnitude 0.8 at 1.7 kilometers in depth on February 2nd, 2019 at 12.55 UTC. Mount Rainier is well below background levels, so why do you think the Cascade Range and some other areas too are becoming extremely quiet, while seismicity, like in strange areas in southwestern Wyoming, in western Colorado, in northern Nevada, and also Utah, other places like that, are seeing an increase in seismicity, but the volcanoes themselves are actually somewhat seeing a decrease. What is going on, guys? What do you think is going on? For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur in Mount Rainier Strata Volcano within the month of February 2019. Notice dominant high range frequencies. No dominant low frequencies at all. The strongest frequencies actually remain between 15 hertz and about 17 hertz or so. Very strange dominant area. <laughs> but it looks like a normal volcano tectonic earthquake. The depth looks somewhat correct. It looks a little bit deeper than what they reported, but, and then also on the spectrogram, you notice there's this very strange monochromatic line right here, with, which I believe to be anthropogenic, which means caused by humans. I don't know, but it's strange. Again, we saw this on Mount St. Helens a few months ago. An earthquake occurred, and then this strange monochromatic signal appeared that looks it really looks fake. I mean, it looks like it's not seismic in nature. However, the one we saw at Yellow, uh, uh, Mount St. Helens, excuse me, the one we saw at Mount St. Helens also started right when the earthquake happened and slowly died down. This one at Mount Rainier, we see this strange line, again, start right when the earthquake started and slowly dies down later on. And, and that's not part of the normal coda of the earthquake. The coda's down here, guys. So what could that be? I thought that was very strange. Here we are at the volcano that gave my mother a very bad day on May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens. This volcano pummeled my mother's house with ash in Yakima and even rained ash on my dad's car in Denver, Colorado. Now the main Mount St. Helens eruption ejected 0.29 cubic miles of ash compared to the possible 140 cubic miles Long Valley Caldera could possibly eject during its next eruption. For the month of February 2019, here let me turn grayscale on, we see a total of 12 earthquakes reported, which for once is actually slightly higher than the total for January. All of the Cascade Volcanoes are going down and down and down and down. Mount St. Helens did see a slight, very tiny increase. About half of the earthquakes occurred directly under the strata volcano itself, with a few spread to the northeast and around the area.
The largest reported earthquake event for Mount St. Helens for February was a magnitude 1.9 at 7.4 kilometers in depth, February 9th, 2019 at 1925 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots of the largest earthquake to occur at the Mount St. Helens stratovolcano for the month of February 2019. Dominant high range frequencies, and notice actually dominant frequencies of all ranges. It's hard to pick out a dominant frequency amongst all of this since this, this earthquake really did have all frequencies involved and going well beyond 25 hertz too. I'm probably thinking maybe going up to 40, 45 hertz maximum. But the dominant frequency, the tallest peak on the spectral plot is showing about, I'm going to say maybe 11 hertz, maybe 11.5 hertz. So normal high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake at Mount St. Helens on February 9th, 2019. Now here we are at the Mount Hood Stratovolcano in Northern Oregon, which straddles the border between Washington and Oregon. Before I start, I just want to put it out there that a new fault line of sorts has been discovered cutting through Mount Hood. A link will be posted below in the description box under resources. However, it will probably be near the end of the resources list. They think this newly discovered fault could trigger a magnitude 7.2 earthquake at best. This is pretty dang crazy for any stratovolcano. If that were to happen, it really could damage the stratovolcano, guys. And not only geologically, but volcanically as well. Who knows what that type of earthquake could do to the magma chamber below. Personally, I think it would kickstart a pre-eruption process that could lead to the emptying of the chamber below. But of course, there's so many processes that could take place, yeah, I, you don't know what could happen. But I do believe it could start a pre-eruption process, that's for sure. Again, this is just preliminary, but it is quite freaky that a fault line like this rests under a stratovolcano this large. Now, for the month of February 2019, here, let me zoom out and turn grayscale on. For February 2019, they are only reporting one earthquake, and that's it, which is actually lower than last month's total, which was a total of three. Although the Cascade Range is going eerily silent, this volcano seems to be staying around the same level, somewhat. It is actually usually never very active at all and is very quiet. The largest and only event reported for February 2019 occurred directly under Mount Hood itself and was a magnitude 0.7 at 3.9 kilometers in depth on February 1st, 2019, 9.16 UTC. This again was the only earthquake reported for this month. Be aware though, there were some very, very tiny, it seemed foreshocks and aftershocks throughout the day of this event. There could have been a tiny, 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 very tiny microquake storm going on because I did see some other microquakes throughout that day a few before and a few after, but this is pretty much it. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur in Mount Hood Stratovolcano within the month of February 2019. Dominant high range frequencies, except, actually, you know what, I'm going to say dominant mid-range frequencies. The strongest frequencies remain between 5 hertz and 15 hertz. Weaker frequencies going a little bit below, and weaker frequencies, of course, going a little bit above. I do not see these frequencies going above 25 hertz much at all. It lasted a normal amount of time for a 0.7 that occurred at 3.9 kilometers in depth, and this appears to be a normal high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, which is always part of the normal background seismicity for volcanoes throughout the world. Now, here is Mount Shasta, which resides just south of the California-Oregon border. Also, if you've ever driven from southern Oregon into California using Interstate 5, you already know that this volcano is very large, right next to the freeway, too. <laughs> For the month of February 2019, there were only, here let me turn on grayscale, there were only two reported events, which is one higher than last month's. I know all of the Cascade Volcanoes are basically going quiet, but this stratovolcano is usually extremely quiet, especially in the past. Now one earthquake occurred directly under the southern portion of Shasta's base, and another, which was the largest, struck farther to the south, but still within the bounds of Shasta. The largest reported event for February was a magnitude 1.3 at 8.2 kilometers in depth on February 14, 2019 at 341 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram spectrogram spectra plots of the magnitude 1.3 that occurred at 8.2 kilometers in depth at Mount Shasta, which was the largest reported event for February 2019. Dominant lower frequencies below 10 hertz, but of course there were some slightly strong, uh, strong frequencies going above that, but it remained primarily below 10 hertz, as you can see by the spectrogram as well. 
Again, though, this is a normal high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, which is part of normal background seismicity at volcanoes throughout the United States and the world. This is from the closest seismic station, LMC, in the NC network. High pass 0.6 hertz filter was added. And here we are at the last volcano in the update, Lassen Peak within the Lassen Volcanic Center in Northern California. Again, Glacier Peak in Washington State will be added to the update once new instruments are installed. This is a volcano right here, which resides in Northern California, just 60 miles southeast of Mount Shasta. For the month of February 2019, they are reporting 40 earthquakes. Wow. They're reporting 40, earth okay, so remember Lassen Volcanic Center is right here. I'm going to turn grayscale on just to see the earthquakes better. Okay, so they have 40 reported earthquakes. Of course, that isn't too major, but that is a sharp increase in seismicity from the past many months. Lassen Peak, which I believe is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Range, was also looking like it was decreasing in seismicity just like all of the other Cascade volcanoes. However, this month really does change things. Of course, magnitudes were not major, but seismicity did increase nonetheless. The largest event in the area was a magnitude 1.8, which occurred far up here. However, as you know, I always like to use an earthquake that is just a little bit closer, so we will use this earthquake here for the following plots. The largest earthquake of February to strike directly under Lassen Volcanic Center was a magnitude 1.6 at 2.8 kilometers in depth on February 8, 2019 at 4.09 UTC. This 1.6 was reportedly felt by one person on the USGS event page. It does not appear to have occurred as part of a swarm, but just know there were other smaller events throughout the day. I'm going to say maybe four, five, maybe even six earthquakes throughout the day when this struck. Here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest event to occur directly under Lassen Peak and Lassen Volcanic Center for the month of February 2019. Notice dominant frequencies, basically of all frequencies. Look, there's a spike, I'm going to say at about 2.5 hertz. That was the strongest frequency was 2.5 hertz. However, notice how right from there it slowly dies down. So there are frequencies of all ranges, pretty much of all strengths, and so this was a normal high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, which is part of normal background seismicity. However, seismicity, again, for Lassen Peak for February, was much higher than previous months, so we will have to wait and see where this is headed. It could have calmed, but let's keep an eye on it nonetheless. Here we are at the GPS deformation instruments for Long, or excuse me, for Lassen Peak Volcanic Center. Let's click P666. I would have picked a different name for it, but oh well. <laughs> Again, when viewing these types of blue deformation charts, the top two hor show horizontal deformation, with east showing east-west and north showing north-south, and the bottom chart shows vertical deformation, in, up in other words, excuse me, uplift or subsidence. Now beforehand, Notice these spikes that coincide with many of the charts in the or excuse me, many of the instruments in the area, and also coincide with the north and the south components. Now, I thought many of these obvious deformation patterns were caused by an increased supply of magma below. I may have been wrong. Although these seem to appear on other stations in the area, I have discovered it could possibly be connected to ice buildup on the machine during winter, and that would explain why there is such an increase on the horizontal charts as well, which isn't shown as much during extreme deformation. I mean, obviously it can happen, guys. Obviously it can happen. But Lassen Peak has been subsiding pretty much for a long, long time, most likely due to activity on regional faults. So there isn't a huge supply of magma getting into the system, but there still is a lot of magma there, guys. There's still active fumaroles. They got a bunch of stuff there. So it's not dead, guys. It's very active. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's the second most active volcano in the Cascade Range, other than Mount St. Helens. Now, it is possible that this could be ice buildup on the machine during winter, and the spikes do coincide perfectly with winter and do occur almost suddenly, but I, I don't know, guys. I don't know. I'm iffy on both sides. That is up to you to decide. Lassen Peak last explosively erupted back in 1915 and is actually the first volcanic eruption to be extensively photographed. Please let me know if I'm wrong on that. And yes, guys, they have very real photos of the Lassen Peak eruption in 1915. Just type Lassen Peak 1915 into Google and check it out for yourself. It, they got some pretty cool images. Really cool how they had some good cameras back then, too. That was over 100 years ago. And Mount St. Helens last erupted 40 years ago. 
So maybe, and you know, USGS said that California does have a 16% chance of seeing a volcanic eruption in the next 30 years. That's a high, high, high chance, guys. That's very high chance. Very interesting. So we'll have to keep an eye on that as well. Now, I just checked to see if I could download the data to these GPS stations. But as you can also see here, they have been offline for a few months now. The only ones online are not at the volcano itself. So I really hope they get them back up and running soon. Look, 664. Yep, it's cut off. Let's look at 665. And yep, it's cut off. And let's see, the only, these ones I believe are working, but they're not that close to the volcano. This one is working, and we do see subsidence is greatly occurring here. Notice how we don't really see the same change that we did at Lassen Peak, so it could be ice buildup. But then again, I don't know. I'm straddling the border on either side, guys. But this one is starting to show an, a large increase in subsidence, actually. And the total range is from bottom to top for the vertical chart is 0.07 meters. And here we are back at the wonderful Upper Geyser Basin, home to the infamous Old Faithful Geyser at Yellowstone National Park and Caldera. So it seems, of course, that Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes do have the highest seismicity counts out of all the volcanoes that I showed for the month of February 2019. Cascade volcanoes seem to be keeping their pattern of diminishing seismicity, all except for Lassen Peak, which saw double the seismicity that it did in January in previous months. It is not major, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Of course, concerning activity at any of these volcanoes will warrant its own video and its own blog post on my website, especially if increased deformation is spotted in conjunction with increased seismicity, almost a sure sign a magma chamber is growing restless for an approaching eruption or major intrusion event. Remember, major intrusion events have occurred before without any eruption. Even harmonic tremor has been detected at many, or actually, you know what, more like volcanic tremor has been detected at many volcanoes without an eruption. However, you know, if you see harmonic volcanic tremor, definitely keep an eye on the place. Remember, it's not just harmonic or volcanic tremor. you got to look out for low-frequency earthquakes, even hybrid earthquakes and also rapid fire swarms as well. For those who watch my videos, please go check out my website. My site is helpful in conjunction with my YouTube videos and it already contains a great many pages with hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images for many different events at many different volcanoes. I will also be able to upload more information on there than if I was only making YouTube videos. So if you like, please go check it out. The link to it is below my email address in the description box below. The next monthly update will be for March 2019, which will be uploaded a few days after the month has ended. I usually try to get my updates out around the 5th of every month, but sometimes it doesn't work out. I hope to someday become more educated in regards to volcanoes and earthquakes and hope to become a volcanic seismologist. But I am already equipped to give you guys a heads up if concerning activity may ever rear its ugly head. Any support would be amazing, guys. I know I'm not talking about money. Again, not talking about money. I'm talking about personal support from my viewers. Thank you all and keep your heads up. And please be prepared with at least three days of food and water per person within your household. And double that for every child that you have under the age of 12, just in case. Because after all, when disaster strikes, you can never be too prepared. You can never have too much food, regardless of what the government tells you. Oh, don't hoard food, even though the government hoards food. Like, come on, guys. We're the citizens. <laughs> Seriously, though, you can't, you can't have too much food when disaster strikes. You can't have too much water, guys. So just, you know, just have a good stock. Just have a good stock just in case. I know I do. If any mistakes have occurred or I'm wrong about something, please feel free to let me know below. I am a chill guy. Again, that is actually okay with some constructive criticism. Keyword there is constructive. Sadly, the world, and especially YouTube, has way too big of an ego right now to even think constructive criticism is a good thing, especially some specific YouTubers. Be humble. This is why I rarely watch YouTube videos anymore. I simply rely on the data for my research while making YouTube videos and blog posts so people can enjoy and learn from the research I spend so much time on. I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. Why? Because the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless, guys. Please stay safe and let me know what you think. Many more pages and blog posts have been added to my site, so don't forget to check it out. Ben Ferriolo, signing off.